Morning, everybody. Just wanted to continue the video series on Isaiah 53. Of course, a popular text among Christian apologists nowadays. But as we mentioned in the previous video, not originally one of the proof texts used by Christians to prove the messianic status of Jesus. And we'll see in this video perhaps maybe why it was not used as a proof text for that um, for his candidacy. I want to, before I start uh, in Isaiah 53, uh, which we refer to as Isaiah 53, but includes a little bit of Isaiah 52, recalling that chapter and verse divisions are not original to the Hebrew text, but were added by Christian publishers in the 16th century. I believe in the Geneva Bible was the first time that there were chapters and verses. I want to just read briefly from a different work, which I touched upon in a different video, which is the codified laws of the Messiah, Hilchot Mashiach, which is found in Mishneh Torah, the repetition of the Torah, uh, work by a medieval ph uh, philosopher and legal thinker, Moses Maimonides, who you've probably heard of in other contexts. And this is codified in the section that's called Of Kings and Wars, chapter 11. And it's going to be important for us to just have this in mind when we read the text that we're going to read today. In the future, the Messianic king will arise and renew the Davidic dynasty, restoring it to its original sovereignty. He will build the temple and gather the dispersed of Israel. Then in his days, the observance of all the statutes will return to their previous state. We will offer sacrifices, observe the sabbatical and jubilee years according to all their particulars as described in the Torah. Anyone who does not believe in him or does not await his coming denies not only the statements of other prophets, but those of the Torah and Moses, our teacher. The Torah testified to his coming in Deuteronomy 33 through 5, which is quoted. I'm going to skip over that. Um, and so it all continues to say different scriptural proof texts. I'm going to skip over that. And just to go down to, um, here we go. Um, one should not presume that the Messianic King must work miracles and wonders, bring about new phenomena in the world, resurrect the dead, or perform, perform other similar deeds. This is definitely not true. Proof can be brought through from the fact that Rabbi Akiva, one of our great sages of the Mishnah, was one of the supporters of, of King Bar Koziba, or Bar Kochba, who would describe himself as the Messianic king. He and all the sages of later generations considered him to be the he and all the sages of his generation considered Bar Kochba to be the Messianic king until he was killed because of his sins. Once he was killed, they realized he was not the Mashiach. The sages did not ask him for any signs or wonders. The main thrust of the matter is this. This Torah, its statutes and its laws are everlasting. We may not add to them or detract from them. And we're, it continues a little bit more. So we, uh, from the previous section, we see that the, uh, to the Messiah will restore certain aspects of the Torah system, particularly the temple, uh, the jubilee and sabbatical years, sacrifices in some sense. And um, we see here, uh, also he does not perform signs and wonders or resurrections or anything like that. If a king will arise from the house of David who diligently contemplates the Torah and observes its mitzvot as prescribed by the written law and the oral law as David, his ancestors will compel all of Israel to walk in the ways of Torah and rectify the breaches in its observance and fight the wars of God, we may with assurance consider him Mashiach. If he succeeds in the above, builds the temple in its place, and gathers the disperse of Israel, he is the Messiah. He will then improve the entire world, motivating all nations to serve God together, as it states in Sephaniah. We won't skip over the proof text. If he succeeds, if he does not succeed in these matters, or is killed, he's not the Messiah. But he should be considered, um, rather, he should be considered as all the other proper and complete kings of the Davidic dynasty who died presuming that this person is of the Davidic line. Um, and then it goes on to explain why uh, Jesus is not the Messiah, according to um, the rabbis, which we might as well include that really quickly here. Jesus of Nazareth, who aspired to be the Messiah, was executed executed by the court. Um, and it goes and cites a proof text. So we'll skip over that. Uh, can there be any greater stumbling block than Christianity? All the prophets spoke of the Messiah as the Redeemer of Israel and their Savior who had gathered the dispersed and strengthened their observance of the mitzvot. 
the, of Torah. In contrast, Christianity caused the Jews to be slain by the sword, their remnants to be scattered and humbled, the Torah to be altered, and the majority of the world to err and serve a God other than the Lord. And then, so it goes on and on about um, different things about Jesus and uh, eventually talks about Muhammad a little bit here too. Um, but so, uh, and that's an interesting topic for a different video, but just so you have in mind the um, system of what the Messiah is supposed to do as we enter into look at the text here. It's uh, commonly used by uh, Christian apologists, particularly uh, Messianic um, Jews who uh, are Christian, but uh, ethnically Jewish, um, that the uh, Targum that we mentioned in the previous video refers to the Messiah in this portion of the text. Uh, and this is true, and I'm going to show you what it says and how it's not a, um, how it should not be interpreted as a Christian proof text, because it does not support the Christian version of the Messiah. So we start with the um, text in Isaiah 52, 13, where we establish who the servant of God is that's going to be talked about, which it talks about, which is Abdi, my servant, um, is going to be exalted and raised to great heights. A modern Jewish commentary tends to see this as referring to, um, to the uh, people of Israel themselves. Uh, and I'm in here in Sepharia, which you should learn how to use. It uh, has all Jewish text available online. I'm going to just check and see what Rashi says, who's the main commentator. Um, and it looks like he's also pointing towards perhaps messianic implications. If we go back to the Targum, we can look at this. And we're, from the previous video, we know that the Targum is a translation, in quotes, non-literal translation, which is meant to convey rabbinic understanding of biblical text. So it is not meant to be a word-for-word -word translation, but a... Um, commentary more or less in a certain sense it translates by adding in uh, words that are not in the original text to show meaning so we can see here that in the um, targum on isaiah 52 it says behold my servant the messiah so the if you look at the uh, aramaic version the words are very similar um, it's it is a very decent translation um, but it adds the word mashiha messiah mashiach um, to the text, which is meant to clarify that this is actually talking about the Messiah. And it says here that the Messiah shall be exalted and extolled, and he shall be very strong. So um, essentially what I'm going to say here is that the Targum is telling us that this is the Messiah, but it's going to read the, the text of Isaiah 53 as referring to the Jewish understanding of the Messiah that we were just thinking about a little bit ago. So the first thing we know is the, is the Messiah is exalted and extolled. And in the text from the Rambam, we saw that the Messiah is going to be a member of the house of David, which means royal lineage, which is an exalted state in society. Let's keep going. Um, so here it says, this says there were many who were appalled at him. And if we click on the link, we can see it gives us the JPS Jewish Publication Society notes um, of how they've cha uh, choose to tr uh, change the translation or ref uh, what choices they've made. Um, so he was marred by his appearance, unlike that of man, his form beyond human semblance. Okay, so what does it say here? <clears throat> it goes and it says, as the house of Israel anxiously hoped for him many days, which was poor among the nations, their appearance and their brightness being worse than that of the sons of men. And that's reflected here in the, in, in the Aramaic. Uh, and this is a translation of the Aramaic, so it's a double translation. But uh, just for the sake of making this easier, we'll stick to the English. Um, so here it's referring to, uh, so it's taking this text, which might be um, used by Christians, because it says his appearance was unlike that of man, he wasn't like humans at all. And this is saying, well, this is actually talking about the house of Israel um, because the house of Israel, the people of Israel, was poor among the nations and they were um, essentially um, persecuted throughout the years. And this is what we saw that uh, Maimonides said because of the um, persecution of Christians, the Jews were, uh, were suffering throughout the ages. So this is telling, this is, you can see line by line, it's going to correct um, what it sees as misinterpretation of the text in Isaiah. Um, the date of the Targum is hard to pin down exactly, but um, would have been in the Common Era, 
first or second centuries uh, CE. So it's quite com it's quite possible that the uh, translators of the Targum were aware of Christian arguments uh, being made about the Messiah. Um, so it's not without uh, it's not outside the bounds of historical possibility that this text, in terms of the translation, was meant to correct what the Jewish um, elite saw as a misinterpretation of a messianic text. So it's, it continues. So just as he shall startle, let's see what they say here. Um, so this is a text, that, a word that is um, unknown. Uh, we don't know exactly what the root means. Um, but they've cho chosen to say startle many nations. Kings shall be silenced because of him, for they shall see what has not been told to them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I don't think that this one is um, that important. So let's just skip over and get to some of the things, the parts that people are more familiar with. Uh, who can believe what we have heard? Upon whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And we'll check on the JPS note. So it says that the vindication which the arm of the Lord affects. So that's kind of a more expanded translation. Um, who has believed this? And whom is now the power of the arm of the Lord revealed? So very similar. So let's go down to here. Um, to the part that we probably, uh, here we go. Uh, he was despised, shunned by men. And there's kind of uncertain by what that means. So anytime that the JPS or uh, Jewish scholars don't know what the Hebrew means, um, you should take what's written here in English as a grain of salt, at a grain of salt. Uh, so we don't really know what, if this is what it means, shunned by men, but that's the best translation. A man of suffering, familiar with disease, a man who hid his face from us. Let's see, I think this is the same thing where we don't really know. Um, I know this is referring us to uh, Leviticus, um, perhaps referring to a leper. He was despised. We held him of no account. So this is sometimes used by Christians to talk about the suffering of Jesus at the hand of the Romans and his death. Um, familiar with disease, maybe. Uh, I'm not sure how this is translated or, or understood by Christians, but perhaps maybe his healing um, shunned by men, which might be referred to the uh, his treatment by the um, Jewish authorities. These are just different possibilities. So, uh, but let's see what the Targum says. His visage shall not be the visage of a common person; rather, his fear the fear of a ple of a plebeian, a common person. Neither his fear the fear of a common person, but a holy brightness shall be his brightness, that everyone who sees him shall contemplate him. Everyone who sees him shall contemplate him. And he shall cut off the glory of the wicked. They shall be weak and wretched, lower and, and contempt and esteem them in a pain appointed to sickness. And I just move myself over there. There we go. Uh, and pain appointed to sickness as if, and as if he had removed the fear of his Shekhinah from him, from us. So you can see that it's expanding quite a bit on what this means. And the first part is qu quite important that it's reiterating that uh, the Messiah is not going to be a common person, which is refer referencing the rabbinic idea that the Messiah will be of the house of David, a royal lineage. Uh, and that means uh, exalted social status. Um, so this person will be um, of the, of the uh, we could say the elite, the upper class of society, good or bad, um, whether that uh, is good or bad is a different question. But you can see that the Targum is systematically reinterpreting the original text to make sure that there are no errors in understanding from a rabbinic point of view. And so here we go. It was our sickness that he was bearing, our suffering that he endured. We accounted him plagued, smitten, and afflicted by God. This is kind of, uh, I think, used by Christians to interpret and understand as a prophecy to Jesus' death, uh, which is understood as an atonement. And let's look over here. Therefore, he shall pray for our sins and our iniquities for his sh sake shall he uh, and our iniquities for his sake shall be forgiven us. For we are considered crushed, smitten of the Lord and afflicted. So you can see it's shifting the focus of the original text um, by offering a commentary, understanding of what this should mean. And it says here that he should pray for our sins but not that he is going to do anything to forgive them. So you can see this is a direct, I think, a direct refutation of Christian atonement theology that would have been developing at the time that the Targum was put into writing. Okay. But he was wounded because of our sins, crushed because of our iniquities. He bore the chastisement that made us whole, and by his bruises we were healed. 
this is probably one of the texts that is directly used by Christians to mean that Jesus died for our sins. Um, and the Targum says, He shall build the house of the sanctuary, which has been profaned on account of our sins. It was delivered over on account of our iniquities, and through his doctrine, peace shall be multiplied upon us. And through the teaching of his words, our sins shall be forgiven us. So here you can see this is a radical reinterpretation of the text, and I think having in mind the Christian understanding of the text. Um, because the text in the original Hebrew doesn't necessarily mean what Christians think it means, but the Targum comes in in Aramaic, writing in the common language, as we understand that to be Aramaic, um, and telling people that this is not what you should be understanding this text to be. Um, we should note that the Talmud uh, considers the Jewish Christians to be a quite serious problem, um, and quite a bit of uh, intellectual weight is thrown against the Jewish Christians in the Talmud um, in the way that the types of social enactments, uh, social legislation that was enacted against them. Um, and so you can see that the the, Talmud, the Targum here in conjunction with the Talmud considers the Jewish Christian ideas of, of atonement to be a serious problem from a rabbinic point of view. And so they say here that he shall build the house of the sanctuary. So it's saying not is because he is dying that, that you are going to be um, receiving atonement, but because he's going to rebuild the temple, as the rabbinic community has always understood the Messiah to be, that would be one of his main goals and things that we would identify him as. Um, so he's going to rebuild the sanctuary, which is going to be the means by which you will have, provide forgiveness of sins. Also, it emphasizes his teaching, which um, should, is supposed to be teaching of Torah, which will bring peace um, to the world. And by being motivated by his teaching, people will repent and be forgiven of their sins. Um, there's probably a critique here about the peace aspect of it, because I don't think um, that the Jewish community saw the Christians and the ascendancy of Christians as a peaceful thing, uh, based on what happened to Jewish communities as a result of the uh, ascendancy of Christianity in the Roman Empire, which led to the extermination of Jews in many countries throughout the world. Uh, that's a topic for a different video. We all went astray like sheep, each going his own way, and the Lord visited upon him the guilt of us all. Again, this is going back to the, the idea of atonement. And the Targum tells us, as we like sheep have been scattered, every one of us has turned his own way. It pleased the Lord to forgive the sins of all for his sake. So it's saying that um, that God is going to be motivated to forgive sins because the Messiah is so righteous and he's going to... Um, promote the teaching that it will bring peace in the world, but not that his death is necessarily a um, atonement, atoning sacrifice, as Christians understand it. Um, and so here we see more, like a sheep being led to slaughter, like a, like a ewe dumb before those who, who, shear him, who shear her, he did not open his mouth. This is obviously referring um, to when the Christians read this text, uh, how they present the death of Jesus under Pilate, uh, where he doesn't uh, defend himself. And the Targum says, he shall pray and he shall be answered. Before he shall be heard, he shall deliver over the mighty of the nations as a lamb to the slaughter. And like a sheep before his shears is dumb, none shall in his presence open his mouth or speak a word. So it's reformulating the idea here of the lamb to the slaughter, which is used by Christians, obviously, to talk about um, the death of Jesus. But here it's talking about the Messiah's ascendancy over the nations, where he will reassert the um, Jewish um, religion. I, uh, there's some different understandings of what this means, but like he will uh, reassert the, the, um, the respect, I guess you could say, um, is maybe a common way of understanding it of the Jewish people and Jewish nations. Um, and this is obviously uh, uh, comes from the uh, persecution that happened after the ascendancy of Christianity. Uh, being a, an oppressed minority people, um, a lot of these ideas come from that negative place. Um, where the um, Messiah is sort of uh, meant to basically get back at the Christians for um, persecuting the, uh, Jews for so long. Uh, and a lot of modern Jewish people are rethinking these ideas of um, that are quite negative. Um, and even the reform movement, which is um, one of the mainstream 
denominations of Judaism in the United States and in Europe um, has reinterpreted the messianic, the, the figure of the Messiah to refer to the messianic age, which will be a, a period of peace and um, uh, prospering for all people. Uh, but that's a topic also for a different video. Um, and so we, I think that we can stop there. I think I've covered the um, majority of the ways in which uh, Isaiah 53 is used by Christians to refer to the atonement, the atonement of Jesus, which occurred through his death, and how the Targum um, is showing the reader how this is not a correct interpretation, and that um, instead, he, the author of the Targum is referring the reader to the rabbinic understanding of Messiah, which will be the exalted um, member of the house of David, who will bring back the temple, who will bring back the sacrifices, who will bring back the full uh, legal civic system of Jewish law, who will um, also reestablish the respect of Israel among the nations, um, et cetera, et cetera. So this is what it's telling us in line by line. It's going through and it is showing that the Christian interpretation is wrong. And um, that is my assertion that the Targum is responding to Christians in its interpretation of Isaiah 53. Uh, I'm sure someone might disagree with that. Um, and it might not necessarily have to be responding to Christians. Um, it could just be presenting a co the common rabbinic understanding of the Messiah. Um, so that is all for today. Let me know below if you have any ideas about this text or if you think I missed something or didn't explain thoroughly a certain aspect of it. And I'll be happy to make another video. Uh, make sure to like this video subscribe to the channel and share. Uh, let me know below if you enjoyed the video and follow me on Facebook.